pre pre show. <laughs> it's wow. because it's our only time to talk candidly. Yeah, completely. We, you I had mean, some I'm... strong words about something, things. and I did too. <laughs> Yeah. And we were able to say those things before we went live. Hi, everybody. Yes. I hope your Thursday is going well. My Thursday is going swelteringly. I mean, literally, because we're in the middle of a heat wave, um, which is kind of rare for September for us. Um, but we'd been promised a, a sort of an Indian summer, a second summer. And then I think what they're doing is basically ramming it all into about four days. So... I'm hoping that it'll last over the weekend um, because um, it's been a full-on week where I've spent a lot of time inside. But hopefully, we'll have a, have a nice weekend out of it because uh, I could really do with a um, a bit of a chill. So, uh, so we shall see. Um, gotcha. What's your, what's your weekend look like? You, have you got? Um, big... I've got. Yeah. Well, I I guess the biggest thing is that I am likely going to be laying down for most of it um this is my one more thing but i'm gonna share it in the pre-show because i was gonna say that we we don't we don't have the explicit rating again are, are we what's up laying down no, no 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 oh oh i see where your mind is going no 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 uh so all right this story is embarrassing um and i've been like i've told this story a couple times already and i've been really struggling with how to how to tell this in a way that it's less embarrassing, but I feel like there's just no way. So maybe you can help me brainstorm it. Um, so the context here, I, for, for the laying down piece, um, I double sprain my knees. I sprain both of my knees simultaneously. Uh, last Saturday. Okay. Hold on. The how is the embarrassing part. All right. So I'm I'm no stranger to good form. All right. With like working out. So if I was squatting in the context of working out, I don't think this would have been an issue. I think it was the context of the squat. Right. Again, just I will just point out the explicit rating on, on that we don't really want to get. So okay, well, no, you're again, your mind is going to like places that it shouldn't, because I think the context of the squat here is what threw me off a little bit. So my son uh, still needs some subtle encouragement to go potty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was squatting down, subtly encouraging him to go potty. And I don't know what happened. <laughs> as, as I came up out of the squat, I heard both my knees pop. And um, I immediately became lightheaded, reached for the nearest thing I could find, which was a stack of toilet paper boxes. Put my hand on it, and they were arranged in just a way that, like, it wouldn't offer me support. So I put my hand on it, fell down, and I don't know what happened after that, but I woke up with, I, I woke up on the floor, face up towards the ceiling, next to my son's potty, um, like, inches from pee. And with my wife hovering over me, asking me, what happened? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not laughing. No, no, no. And it, I mean, it's hilarious now. It was really scary in the moment. Uh, <laughs> and so I don't, I don't exactly know what happened. Um, I can walk on them now. They are, they hurt. Mm -hmm. I was in double knee braces earlier this week. Um, wow. And I'm still having some difficulty, like getting up and some mobility issues uh, and some pain issues, but like healing. The, the, so, the whole pop and passing out bit, that's the bit that I think would, I don't know, mildly concern me. That's the uh, part that mildly concerns me too. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, I've, I was going to say, have you been to the doctors or anything with this? But that I guess it's a slightly more difficult conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. 
in the US. You can't. It's not as easy. Just well, I mean, said that in the UK, I could go. Easy. I could have gone to urgent care. But look, here's the thing: is I'm not, I wasn't like if I was completely unable to walk, if my knees were like buckling, uh, mm. I was able to walk after it, albeit in pain and um. Which led me to believe that it was not a serious injury. I'm still monitoring the situation, and if things don't progress, to so I will, I will take you back to a, a human factors lecture you must have had around point of pain, pain evolution, and that's you know yeah. they're just that general stuff, and the which can be summed up as as the you know, the, the pain is trying to tell you something and walking around in severe amounts of pain after just crouching and your knees going pop, it's possibly a message that you might want to take a bit more strongly and considerate in a way that I wouldn't if I, I would do exactly what you're doing and thinking that yeah, I'll get, it'll get better. But at least I can, I feel better now having said that to you in a lecturing sort of. Manner. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank um, you. I appreciate the lecture. I will. I, will, I believe me. I have my threshold. Like, here's the thing is I have predefined thresholds for like, how long must pain persist before I talk to a medical professional? Mine's only about four months. <laughs> and it it's like this matrix of severity and time, okay? In my yeah. head, this is how I see it. It's a it's a severity time matrix where I'm like, oh, if it's a pain scale of like ten and it persists for longer than a day, go. If it's like a pain scale of uh, you know, a five and it persists more than a month, then go. And I'm somewhere at like, you know, a seven with what happened. And so I'm looking at like maybe half a month. So if, if it, um, so, so like two weeks. So I'm, I'm looking at like, you know, if it doesn't get better by the end of next week, I'll go. And you go. Fair enough. Yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of how I do it. Although it was like a seven when it initially happened and it's slowly worked its way down to like a five or I'm probably at a five, but it's still like the initial onset of the seven is where, yeah. Yes. Um, that's where, when I did my, I had the trap nerve in my shoulder that uh, my wife sort of recognized that I was in real pain when I was like, no, I, I think I need to go and see the doctor now. I think I need to, I think I need to go and talk to somebody because this, this just no. Um, so Yes. Well, I, I often attribute like me still being here to my wife because she, yeah, she, I, my appendectomy is <laughs> like curdled over on the side in the bathtub going, oh, she's like, go to the doctor. I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I just need a suppository. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what. So, um, See, happy Thursday, everyone. There, there you go. There's the story to start us off. Partners are amazing. When they choose, yes. when, when they choose to be. Yes, <sighs> yes, yes. So we've got a cool story tonight. It, it feels, Barry, like we've done this story before. Well, we. That's kind of if we're not careful, we have. Because um, if we go down the, um, let's have another go at um, having a go at Elon Musk again. Because let's face it, um, that's always fun at the moment. Are we just bashing on him every week now? Is that I, what's in, well, if he didn't have his finger in so many pies, or in this case, in your brain, then um, then he, he, we wouldn't. But uh, but I think that's where we've got to try and steer clear of that. I mean, acknowledge that the fact that he's a uh, he, he's driving the the leading technologies in this at the moment. But fundamentally, that's really we're talking around um, once, once his technology is there. Um, what do we need to do about it in terms of human rights? In terms of what do you, what are your rights? Because actually, the more I got thinking about this, I think the scarier it becomes. Which we'll 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 talk about in the show. But it's you sort of, we when we sort of think about human rights and stuff, we we think about the really formal stuff. Um, but then yeah, so I was like, well, well I, if you this whole idea of mental privacy, the amount of stuff that goes on in my head that um, I don't want me to know about, never mind anybody else. Um, you know, things that, you know, you know, when you get like the random thoughts that just float across your mind, like, I've got no idea where that came from. Um, or you, yeah. you think of three or four thing, different things at once, or ju just when you get distracted and stuff like that. Who wants to 
understand and know that I've kind of got, I guess, an image of having a, you know, almost a TV screen on in the background um, where somebody's put the Matrix type spike into the back of your head and, and it starts playing all the stuff that goes on in your um, in your mind. That That's just, there's a lot of stuff there that people just don't want to see. And I think we'd look at people in very different ways. So you just reminded me of a TikTok I saw earlier this week. Those random thoughts that come into your head. Uh, <laughs> this uh, this family at like, you know, cliffs by an ocean. There's a child there and the child says, oh, look how close that lady is to the edge. She could just one push and she could go. Wee! <laughs> <laughs> and the mom comes in and says, those are intrusive thoughts and we don't say them out loud. <laughs> Oh, it had me in stitches. Um, it's uh, no, but you're right. I mean, there, there is so many random things <laughs> you think that you're just like going, mm, Squee! Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna, oh my god. All right. Oh, geez. But you're right, though. We've done this before in terms of certain elements in, in yeah, in more than one episode in one way or another, but. Definitely won't. Um, so I, I I will say this episode will get very close to episode 279, where we talked about BCIs as a device posing a threat to our mental privacy. And this article is more along the lines of the rights that we have with that. So I feel like we can kind of continue that discussion because... A lot of the things that we talked about in that previous discussion were on things about um, kind of the the larger trend of like Meta, Microsoft, Apple, all developing these BCIs and potentially designing these things to for for friendly user experiences, but also the mental health impacts, and then also the misuse of these BCIs and data around them and potentially kind of what they could be used for in terms of their application. And so like, this will be more on the like privacy side of things where we're looking at what should, what should be included in a, in a like bill of rights, so to speak uh, about medical mental privacy um, or, or I guess, uh, mental rights, neuro rights, as they're calling it in this article. So it's going to be a good companion piece, I'll yeah, say, I think so. to, to the other one. And I think we have enough differentiating factors here for this episode that we can go off of. Yeah, it's interesting because actually I sort of assumed that we wouldn't talk about the technology at all, but actually... There is going to be a bit of the technology to a certain extent, because I guess there is going to be the, you know, do you have the right to hook up and unhook? Um, I guess it's a, it's it's sort of technology agnostic. It's about the interface, but it's if you um, if you want. Oh yeah, there's definitely a tech piece here for sure. So, so I'm going to change what my. Um... Okay, you go ahead and change that. Yeah, um, just because um, I think we should be looking at. Um, actually, there's a whole bunch of other notes as well we should be doing. Um, but I might just scroll down and, and look at that. Um, and, uh, I'm not today either. I had, uh, <laughs> um, as I said last week, we moved into new offices. And um, so I was putting my desktop back together. So my laptop and the hookup and the because um, I've got more of a gaming keyboard because I find the gaming keyboards work better um, and and the, key, and the, and the mouse because I like the pretty light. Um, but then my typing, my spelling and everything was just way worse than usual. And I'm like, I know my my spelling isn't brilliant and I type pretty quickly, but I'm not a proper touch typist and things like that. And so I do spend time correcting errors. But it was way worse than usual, like really way worse. And I couldn't work out what was going on. It wasn't until I slowed everything right down and I started looking at what was going on the screen as opposed to what I was typing. And basically, the keyboard wasn't working pro since the move. 
the keyboard that just wasn't working properly and, and, and that, so i swapped it out for a, a, a standard keyboard and now my spelling and writing is has just moved up to being rubbish my usual level of rubbish as opposed to completely incompetent so i think i might be in in line for a, a new keyboard mm. you should get one of those um cording keyboards have you seen those no the the cord keyboards that stenographers use you must have seen them i might have, but i don't recommend them. they're they're fascinating um They're, they're f fascinating devices, and they allow you to type. Um, I, I think it's called a chord keyboard uh, for stenography. What's it called? Oh, um... Corded keyboard. So basically, the, the way it works is instead of hitting keys serially... You hit keys in parallel. And these combinations of keys allow you to type really quickly. Oh, okay. And so you so you can hit many like like uh that's that's how you can see like this live closed captioning that's happening by a stenographer in like a courtroom. Yes. Yeah. Or or something like that is because they have a corded keyboard where these different combinations of buttons um allow you to type very quickly. And so you're, it's it's like you know mashing combos on a controller, except you're doing it with a keyboard to write words at a time. And uh, stenotype is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. Here, I'll uh, courtesy of Wikipedia. Um, this, let's just share that one. This is what a stenotype looks like. Okay. And you can see there's no letters or anything on it. And you just learn the chord combinations. Cool. But you might be able to, you know, make like one word with one hand and then the next word with the other hand and just keep going back and forth. And it's like. Apparently, you can you can make them you, you can you can write really fast. <laughs> um, WPM with a stenotype first keyboard. Let's see. So you can write, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in one stroke on a stenoty uh, stenotype. Wow. Um, which, which is just amazing versus well, hitting all those keys individually, right? But presumably that is more around taking phrases that they would use on a regular basis and basically setting up short cookies. No. Oh, okay. But in that case, I'm completely wrong. No, the way a uh, stenotype it's it's not a um to be clear, it's it's not a keyboard that works like uh it, it's not a keyboard that works like a, a, a macro generator. Mm -hmm. It's essentially here I'm gonna re I'm gonna read this. So on a corded keyboard, you hit multiple keys at once instead of one at a time. A chord is only registered when you release all the keys. The order that you press them down doesn't matter. Only which keys you hit is important. So the there, there's a lower number of keys. So what I showed you on that that was a double one. So you could actually do one hand on each of them to do two words at once. Wow. That's one of those is is a corded keyboard. And it has 
kind of the vowels at the bottom. Those those four, here, I can actually just share this too. It's it's fascinating because I feel like this could be really a a good way to teach typing, and I I might do this for my son. <laughs> Although he's already familiar with a QWERTY keyboard at the age of three. So there's that. But this is this is a QWERTY keyboard. And um, it doesn't have an I key. It doesn't have an N key. It doesn't have a shift and no punctuation. It has two S's. Oh, uh, yeah. Two T's, two P's, and two R's. And... Everything that's missing from the base layout is made up from combinations of other keys. Not really that, but the names of the keys that don't represent letters, they represent sounds. You hit the U key, the result is not the letter U. It is the full word U. So in that sense, it works like a macro, but when corded with things, it... That brings it in. Oh. Right. It's interesting that I think the because what a lot of people oh I don't know whether this is um, just rumor or whatever, but the the reason we've got the um, layout of keyboard we've got at the moment is actually to slow typists down rather than be more efficient um, from when we had um, proper typewriters and to stop the clashes of the mechanical um, printing elements coming together. Right. So, um, if this is because of, I guess now with digital, then we can afford to to speed things up. So, um, interesting. Yeah. So you you hover your your fingers in the middle there, go up, go down, and like I want to see. Oh, and and you can hit all those keys at once. So like. I want to see an example. The vowel key in the middle. It's so fascinating to me. Uh, yeah. I'm, and anyway, I'm now just looking up to see whether I say um, whether what I said is true or it's just urban myth. I think it might just be over myth. So the, the QWERTY did place common alphabet letters at a distance from each other. Uh, right. To stop them. Okay, that's what I thought. I, I didn't want to say anything, but I thought they had organized the keyboard in a way that made the most common letters easily easier to access, right, and move things like Z out of the way, so that way you're not reaching for that as much. Um, um, so it, you know, Z, Q... So it's, it's it's sort of half right in that um, it was made because of to make the the act of mechanical typing more efficient, um, but it is still less efficient. It's still less efficient than modern day keyboards such as the Dvorak and the Coleman uh, the Colmac layouts, which I don't know what they are. Um, I guess I now need now need to know what that looks like to understand the difference. Next week on the show, yes, corded it, keyboards. Oh, um, I see. Okay. So the Dvorak keyboard layout is just looks odd, but puts the most common keys right on that center row. Um, not vastly different, but it is enough. And the coma is... It's got... right. Yeah. It, again, it's a similar principle, but it's... Um, or similar intent. It's just a... a um, a change around to be more efficient, even more efficient to not worry about the mechanical. Interesting. So I didn't think we, I didn't think we'd end up going down that, down that route. No, I didn't think so either. Um, before we start, I, w I wanted to just like mention one other thing. Mm -hmm. Go for it. And it's one, or it's not one more thing. It's, um, it's the, it came from today. Mm-hmm. Usually, I am just, come on. <clears throat> Some weeks, I don't even think we should do it, honestly. And I've been thinking about that. But, but, 
this week. The questions are phenomenal. They're certainly questions that I think we can um, actually provide some decent input to instead of just saying, get another job. Oh, um, what, what's what's the other one? Um, yeah, your portfolio, just make it up with whatever you've got. Um, you know, all them sort of things. You can tell I've had the, so I'm in this cabin at the bottom of my garden. You can tell that I've had it open all day to try and get the heat out of it. It's because there's so many bugs in here. It's unreal. But, um, you on the top of my telly. There we go. Um, so if you see me randomly just trying to bat things um, and hit things like that, it's because my it's, it's turned into a... Um, Amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think the three questions are good. They're valid. And um, definitely a, a vein uh, in, in a different in a different vein from our normal. Indeed. Yes. Um, Samey questions. I think they're good. I think they're good little nuggets of info. Yes. I, I, I completely agree. Um, we've got three minutes. Is there anything else we need to be doing before we go live? I think. I think we could. Um, I'm hoping I can come come up fair because and and actually get some new interviews done on twelve or two because I've had the same interview up now for quite a while. I don't actually it's a couple of weeks, but um, yeah, I'm behind on that. Um, I'm hoping by the end of September that life becomes slightly easier. Though I don't think it will, but um, I think it's still going to become still going to be full on. Um, but I've got new team members joining in October, so um, life might become somewhat easier then. Um, for some reason, something didn't happen here in the right way. Oops. I don't know why that is. Okay. Wow, really? You're one more thing. Okay. Yes, I, I mean. Okay. All right. Yeah, I get you. I, I feel that a lot. But like also. No? Yeah, no, it's, it's completely. I mean, I'll say it's completely down to me. Um, and prioritization being. Um, I if I, I might change it because I might be a bit more honest about something that I that was reflected about me and the way I lead, and uh, which was equally a slap in the face and a interesting, useful realization point. Um, oh, okay. I'm I'm interested in this. I love me some self reflection. Yeah, I think I might. Um, yeah, I'm, I might be. I might go down that route. Um, in fact, they're both um, linked. So, okay, um, okay, cool. Oh, and it is still very warm in here. It's sweltering. It is. So again, as well as wafting around trying to hit bugs, um, you're probably going to see me sat just melting in a um, in a thing. So the the, the breaks that we have is, is going to be me dashing outside, sticking my head under water, and all that sort of stuff. Awesome. If you don't come back from this intro with a, a, a drenched scalp, <laughs> I'm going to be disappointed. We'll be right back. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for human factors, psychology, and design. Hi, everybody. Hi. This is September 7th, 2023. This is Human Factors Cast, episode 293. I'm your host, Nick Rome, and I'm joined today by Mr. Barry Kirby. Hello. Hi, Barry. Your head's not wet. Oh, it is. You just can't see him very well. I'm okay. All right. Down here. 
Oh, oh nice. For context, go watch the pre-show. Uh, <laughs> we got an amazing show for you all lined up tonight. We're going to be diving into the fascinating world of neurotechnology once again and how it's blurring the lines around mental privacy and what it means for our neuro rights. And um, later on, we'll be answering some questions from our community about traveling jobs for human factors professionals, creating research questions, and when to delete usability test recordings. Nice, refreshing change from some of the normal questions we get. But before we jump into all that, let's kick things off uh, with some programming notes. Uh, hey, we're not going to do a show next week. 8-14. Uh, 9-14. It is no longer August. It is September. No show September 14th. Changing that in the show notes. Uh, and if you do have the means to, you, we would love for you to go leave us a review and tell your friends about the show. And if, if you have the money and you want to do that too, we have a Patreon. You know, Find all about that at the link. Uh, but Barry, I have to know what's going on over at 12.02. So at 12.02, the latest interview is an interview with Dr. Mark Young. Um, and he's a, a, one of these people who spent a fair bit of time in academia and in industry. And he's just flipped back again to go back into academia. So we talk about that balance between academia and industry and what it means, what both sides could learn from each other um, in terms of what our priorities are and what our drivers are. Also, Mark is the upcoming um, president, so he's the current president-elect of the CIHF, so we talk a bit about what his ambitions are for the Institute. So, well worth going to listen. Perfect. Well, let's not bury the lead. Let's get into the, show, into the article of the show and the thing with... I love it when I cut myself off because I'm just stumbling over the words. <laughs> This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. Barry, what is the story this week? As long as you promise not to cut me off before I finish. Um, the story this week is about new... Okay, I promise not to cut you off. Oh, sorry. I asked for that, didn't I? Totally. Um, <laughs> the story this week is about new neurotechnology. Uh, is blurring the lines around mental privacy, but are new human rights the answer? So in the article, the author discusses the advancements of neurotechnology and the ethical and privacy concerns that come along with it. They highlight the growing number of companies developing brain-computer interfaces, BCIs as we've referred to them in the past, and the potential benefits for patients with paralysis or neurological disorders. However, it also raises the important questions around mental privacy and autonomy. They argue that while neurotechnologies can record brain activity with great specificity, um, inter interpreting and reading the, the activity is complex and not straightforward. They compare the privacy risks of neurotechnology to those of, of more familiar data collection technologies like online surveillance or wearable devices. The article also delves into the concept of cognitive liberty, which is the right of individuals to think independently and autonomously. Proponents of cognitive liberty argue that greater regulation of neurotechnology is needed to protect individuals' freedom to control their own thoughts. However, the author suggests that the way cognitive freedom is discussed neglects the relational aspects of who we are and how we think. They emphasize that the importance of acknowledging the many influences and forces that shape our thoughts and advocate uh, for a holistic approach uh, to protecting privacy and freedom in an era of advancing neurotechnologies. This article raises important questions around the social and ethical implications of new technology and calls for thoughtful consideration and regulation in order to protect individual rights. So, Nick, what are your thoughts on... Oh, oh, wait, hold on. Can I not just plug a USB into you and read your thoughts directly and it'd be there for all to see? Wouldn't that be scary? Uh, so, oh, yeah. so this topic might sound a little familiar um, to listeners of the show. There's going to be some overlap with uh, another episode that we did back, I think, in March of this year. We was talking about neuro privacy. Uh, it was episode 279. So we're going to try to focus on the neuro rights rather than the technology piece. Like I said, there will be some blurring and some overlap here, but it'll be kind of a continuation of that discussion. So my first thoughts is, yes, we should have human rights to our thoughts and our privacy and our brain uh because no way am i letting elon musk inside my head um i don't know how you feel but if if we're going to continue the theme of last week of hitting elon musk over the head of bad decisions no way am i letting him in my brain uh i <laughs> i get worried about the aggregation of data from things like my browser history or my search queries you know like how can you give me a targeted ad 
when I didn't even search for that thing, but some, and I may have said it, and my thoughts somehow have connected. When I say thoughts, my my search patterns, my my uh, browsing history on social media or whatever has somehow indicated to these algorithms that I need an ad for deodorant or something. I don't know, right? How does it do that? Um, well, it aggregates all the data, and and but how does it transform that data? We don't know. Uh, <laughs> there's if you can do that with brain and thoughts, uh, that's a lot more scary. Um, and especially when you start to get to like neurodivergence where you might have more errant thoughts than maybe someone who's neurotypical. So like I I was bringing it up in the pre-show, but like invasive, intrusive thoughts, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) what if you have those, (laughs) like, are you going to get an ad for something? I don't know. Uh, but I, I mean, I, to me, I think this just calls for like an incognito mode for your mind. Um, it, you know, can you turn it on and off? You brought up that question also in the pre-show. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of cart before the horse here, Barry. I'm, what are your initial thoughts on this? My initial thoughts are quite long. Um, I think for, to sort of reinforce the point that you made, um, let's not worry about specific technologies. Um, let's, let's give Elon a break. Um, assume fundamentally that for the sake of this discussion that this is a thing that, that we can do or we're close to it. But as we get close to it, it is absolutely right that it is something that we should be talking about. We have learned through the examples you've just highlighted around the evolution of the way that people can use and 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 abuse data <clears throat> and and also, you know, really interrogate it in a really deep way that um that we didn't know about before so the way we talk way we talk about this a lot of this is evolutionary but in the similar way that we talked about the the um the the, the space stuff that the FEA were doing um because we now know we've learned that about that we need to be doing some of this early then we should really use the example of this as well and yes let's let's talk about and let's put some rights in place again having that that piece around it that we we don't restrict what we can do because I think there is some amazing things we can do with this. We talk about a neurodiversity. I think this will lead us to understand better what neurodiversity is all about. And actually, I think the the we'll find out that the idea of being neurotypical is probably quite a rare thing. Um, that we we understand more about the wonderful thing that we currently abstractly just call a spectrum which i think is way you know it's, it's way too simplistic and now this will help us learn more we don't want to restrict that type of understanding but equally we um we are a long way i think from the movies would have us believe that or you know our simplistic way of understanding this is we, somebody puts a spike out of the matrix inside your head um and we we will just get a verbatim stream or a movie of what your thoughts are. And we don't think, I certainly don't think that, I mean, I don't think like that. Um, That's, and I don't know, we don't really know how anybody else thinks it's our uh, extrapolation of doing, doing that type of thing. So what that looks like, how we interpret that is still miles and miles away. So it does frame the question around neural rights and what are they actually consisting of? So we quite rightly said we have freedom of speech. What about the freedom of thought? If you're having nice, pleasant thoughts, you know, fluffy clouds and nice beer, that type of thing, um, you know, that's their all fine thoughts. But what about thoughts that might be um, close to the edge that the you, you might be having um, violent thoughts, you might be having um, thoughts about other people that are fine in your own head, um, or you might have an opinion that um, you never voice. But you might still think, but you have per, you have personal self control that you don't do anything about that. Um, is it right that actually we could actually censor the way that you think? So the, the obviously the obvious film correlation here is nineteen eighty four, where you have like thought speak and thought crimes um, and things like that. We would we need to make sure that uh, you know our democracy relies on the need um, for people to be able to think and and have that freedom of speech. But I think also this is more than just simple, and I use that word, um, you know, in do the whole inverted commas thing, simple civil, civil liberties, because it's not just about being able to communicate um, 
with other people. What about what does it mean for like communicating at home with loved ones? Um, will there be a demand almost to be able to hook up on that mental level and there be that level of expect, expectation to do that? And what could that mean for relationships? What could that mean for um, for building up relationships and the relationships that are breaking down? What what right do we have? to have a, have a secret, to have our own personal thoughts, our own personal um, opinions about things that we never um, pass on to anybody else. Um, having no, uh, then, so that's a whole one package that I would like to explore. The second bit is how do these thoughts get stored? So having not, not talking about specific technologies, but around if we are thinking these things, they get uploaded somewhere to the cloud, whatever that cloud looks like, who owns the cloud, what rights do they have to with that cloud? You mentioned the whole, uh, sort of Google Ads type of thing. What would Google do with the, do with that, or and and or any other company who get gets their hands on it? Um, and then if somebody else can get hold of your experiences, what happens if they use your experiences for their own gain? So if you've done something and then they use the way that you've done something because they've basically shared your experience that that they've hacked into it or whatever it is, and they use your experiences for their own benefit without asking your permission or you knowing about it. Is that theft? Is that something around that? I, I, and I don't know quite where that goes. There's, I know there's been loads of work done on it on, on various aspects about doing this in a positive aspect, about being able to share information, share uh, that, that type of thing. But what about on, on the nefarious side? So uh, I think I've, I've rambled on quite a lot about a whole bunch of different things. Um, where do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I, I, you mentioned too. I'm thinking of this <clears throat> multi-dimensionally as well. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm almost like so to get at your point about like your your own thoughts. Um, I I feel like there's sort of this right to autonomy. We should be able to think freely without any influence from outside sources. Uh, or interference from outside sources, right? And I think that is kind of, should be the foundation. We have the right to think freely. Um, I think there's also some of the things that you brought up around data ownership and where is that data stored? I think that there, you know, th there should be some, if you're, if you're thinking about like almost like a bill of rights for our thoughts, I, I feel like, or mental privacy, however, neuro rights, as this article puts it, I think we must think about sort of who owns that data. And it should absolutely be the person with those thoughts because they are the originator of those thoughts. Is there a shared ownership? I don't think there should be. Um, is there licensing? I don't think there should be. I th But like, again, how do you use that for some of the technology? I don't know. I just think that you should have the ownership to those thoughts wherever it's stored on a data center because you are the originator and there shouldn't be any gotchas in like the EULA <laughs> end user license agreement. I think there's also an element of consent with collecting thoughts. You should have a right to consent for lack of a better term, what data can and can't be collected I mentioned incognito mode earlier. To me, that's like, I don't want you collecting anything right now. Mm -hmm. I am in a space where I am brainstorming ideas for, I don't know, offshoot podcasts. And I don't want anybody stealing those ideas because they're stored in a database and you don't have good privacy or, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, right to turn it on and off, right to consent when those technologies come in. I think there's also... Along the same lines of like the data center, I think there's got to be rights for being able to erase that data um, and and protecting people from having their data stored against their will. Um, so, you know, when that happens, there's also the transparency elements about data centers and all that stuff, too. So I think there's a lot of different things that I'm thinking about from that perspective as well. And it it almost be kind of fun to think up a, a bill of rights. Like, and I, I don't think that we're fully capable of doing that right now on this podcast on the fly. It's not like we prepared that extensively for this show. I mean, not to the extent that we would go through and look at bill of rights and everything. But I mean, 
you think about some of these things in connection to older technologies, right? So like the autonomy, um, you know, I, you can think about how some of these algorithms on social media are influencing our thinking and decision making. And you can, like I said, with those advertisements, like those are coming from somewhere and it's the connection of browsing history from from like another data perspective, I can see it being like, yeah, we we need to avoid that. And I think that should be absolutely true for for social media too. You should have that sort of autonomy. I think when when you compare this to other like rights that are codified in various governments across the world, and not so much in others, but like this this is very similar to like freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. Um you have the the right to express your thoughts without interference not without consequence that's another interesting piece though well i, I was going to say because the, the the um the freedom of speech is and i'm going to use the wrong terminology but the freedom of speech isn't an absolute right it is a uh, no. it's a conditional right on you know and we're seeing that i think more and more at the moment around um you know social approval so the way we talk about race, the, so we've got the protect, protected characteristics, for example. Um, so when we talk about, you know, the absolute right to freedom of speech, actually, we don't necessarily have that um, in that same way. So is there, in the same way that we have protected characteristics in terms of freedom of speech and things like that, how do, free, how do protected characteristics work in, yeah. in, in yeah. your thoughts? Because, exactly. wow, head blown. Um Right, so let, let, let's go a bit simpler than that, because I think we need to go back to that one. Um, and that. Okay, let's come back to that one. Where do you want to go? Where, where else do you want to go? A couple of simple scenarios. Um, when you get arrested, you have a... Um, you can take the fifth. In, in America, in the UK, we have the, um, the, the, the right not to say anything. Um, unless it harms your defence... Blah 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 blah. Um, thankfully, I've never had it read to me, so I, I can't... Um, I can't. I don't know the Miranda off by heart. But... The the police have a right to question you uh, when you're when you're chat when you're been um, when you've been arrested and, and all that sort of stuff, and and then they can take whatever you say and use that uh, as evidence. If you've got an ability to have a device and say it's actually a fairly simple device, it's it's the equivalent of USB or whatever it is, but they can actually just hook you up. Um, should they have the right to do that? What do you think? I thought you were going simpler. This is, to me, a more complex situation. <laughs> well, actually, no. I th- I, so I think the fundamental principle of the police, the our, uh, and let's split up police from justice for the moment. Uh, okay. So just the police. You've you've been arrested, Nick. You've been arrested. You've done whatever you've been doing. Um, the police are, and they want to know what you were doing at a particular time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you, do they? And they and we have the technology. It's easy. Blah blah blah. They they're a trusted entity because they, we we um, elect and um, you know the police force. Should they be able to plug into you and be able to get where you were at a particular time and what you were doing and thinking, etc. Okay, this kind of goes back to my point about consent. Mm-hmm. For me, I think I think there is a right to consent. If you say I've done nothing wrong, you can plug in, and if they find something that's not, you know. You did do something wrong. You've consented, and that is your choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think this connects to other things, um, like so, so let, end user license agreements. Okay, okay. Let me take that a bit, little bit further because you, you've there's some there's two things that you've raised there, which I think is really interesting. Firstly, okay. if I don't consent, does that imply guilt because I'm hiding something? Now we have so you. I think in the in it shouldn't it shouldn't. But um, if you give a um, a no comment interview, for example, then um, that can be sort of characteristically used against you in the courtroom. I think in the your Miranda rights still say that actually you know you can you can you don't have to say anything unless um, you don't have to say anything at all because you because you've got the the Fifth Amendment. In the UK, we've got, it's it's our they change slightly differently. So. Um, you can no comment, but if you later rely want to rely on something in court that you haven't said previously, then that makes it more difficult. So they're trying to encourage mm. discussion. Um, so 
that's one thing. So if you so you can no comment, do the equivalent of a no comment. No, you can't. You can't plug in. Um, right. What are the consequences of that? And I think that's that's almost captured already in that idea of I'm doing. I'm taking the fifth. What happens? They plug in. You've 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 consented to this that you said right. You you can plug in and prove that I wasn't um, jaywalking or I I wasn't speeding or whatever it was or I I didn't um, murder that individual. They find that actually yes that's legit. You've that's proven your alibi. That you know you you weren't you you didn't do it. But actually they in they accidentally find something else. They maybe look a bit, you know, because as we sort of said, is the technology going to be the sort that says, right, you know, I'm all, I only want to look at thoughts between nine thirty two and nine forty seven. Um, I can't see it being as simple as that. Um, there's going to have to be some level of analysis, some level of interpretation, um, almost like um, like like a psychological interview type thing. Um, and if they, if if the person doing the interpretation that type of thing finds. Oh well, no, they didn't do that. But actually, they've been doing tax fraud for the past forty years. Um, is that admissible? So that's one thing, and I think it's interesting because I think it, that's you know you can go down to a whole web of um, things there. A, 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 twist it though. Let, let's make it a, a force for good. Um, you've had knee complaints. You're going to go and see the doctor. Will the um, you you get to the doctor and they say it's okay, just let me hook in, and um, and then I'll be able to understand what you were doing, what you were thinking at the time, why you did so, such an activity, or even I mean, right. would this work if you're unconscious? That'd be cool, or not? Do you have to give positive consent to plug in? Because if you rock up to the ER um, unconscious and they have the ability to plug in and work out what you're doing for completely good, you know, genuinely good reasons. But then they find stuff out. I mean, where where do do you have to consent before that happens? Or can people do just jack in to your brain just for just for fun? What do you think? Yeah, I think I think well, there's you've brought up a lot of really interesting uh I'm here. <laughs> questions. So so there's like you could let's let's start with the medical because that's where my head is at right now. Okay. So there are informed consent practices in medical. And and I think that is a good analogy to take when it comes to plugging in at the doctor's office. Do you give consent? Yes. You know, patients must be informed prior to whatever procedure they're getting done, or in this case, a BCI, that what data is being accessed. Um, and they, they got to give consent for that. And I think that is going to be fairly analogous to the rights that are present today. I feel like that's just going to be built on. When it comes to other things, like if you're unconscious, I feel like you must have other safeguards in place. Like like in some cases, there's like people with DNRs, do not resuscitate um, instructions, basically that if they go offline, they're not going to reboot them. So I think something like that could potentially exist for this. If I'm unconscious, do not plug me in. Even if it could be life-saving, do not plug me in. And I think that is the right, to, that that falls under that right to consent too. Now, when it comes to law, I, d- I don't know all the answers. And I feel like- Before we jump into the law a bit. Okay, 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 go. With the, you know, this informed consent with the doctors, what am I consenting to? And the reason I asked the question is, if I consent to a blood test- I consent to a blood test and they take the blood, but I they still turn around and I'm consenting to a blood test for this test, this test, this test, this test. You can only use my blood te- blood to do, or you can, you you are using my blood to do these four tests. You can't then go off. They they're not allowed to then go off and do a um, say a pregnancy test or a another test that um, right. that you haven't approved to. Uh, you have to you have to approve the use of. If I'm saying Yes, of course you can jack in. What am I? Okay, be careful with your language here. That's, we don't want to get. That's true, but it's, it's a it, that's a good matrix phrase, so that's fine. Um, if I'm hooking up, what am I allowing you to see? And how do I? How, that's true. Um, how do I know whether my rights have been infringed or not? 
Because it's not like you can say, oh, well, actually, look, I've got evidence here. You took five tests instead of four. You took two vials of blood instead of one. Um, all you've got is, at the moment, we assume that, that you're, you know, the, the thoughts are not getting sucked out of your head. They're, um, they're being read. So, or they're, you know, in- interpreted in some way. So you presumably don't know what has and has not been read, interpreted, whatever, whatever the terminology. Is. Okay. All right. All right. Let's, let's cart horse this because I think there's two things going on here. I think one, we're talking about rights in the sense of like in a perfect world, this is what should happen. I think what some of the stipulation that you're throwing out there could be seen as this middle ground where technology could potentially overstep when we haven't necessarily figured out how to rip the correct thoughts out. And so I guess what comes first, the rights or the devices? The devices are already out there or they're starting to be developed, which is, I think, why we need sort of these rights because the rights will drive the limitations of the devices. If we say that you cannot access these parts of the brain or whatever it is that is happening, then these companies will build the devices to do exactly that. Now, they might fail. They might need to get government approval to do some things. It might be red tape and caution tape everywhere to get those things done. But they'll happen in a way that will be adhere- in adherence with those that Bill of Rights, that, that Neuro Rights. If it goes the other way and it happens like AI, where there's this big boom and everyone's like, oh, look what we can do with this. We can all these nefarious purposes. We can fake your grandma's voice and get your pin number without any laws in place. Right. And I'm sure that breaks some, but that's up for interpretation (laughs) right now because it's not codified in an AI bill of rights. But if we had done the AI Bill of Rights before all this technology, then, and we had specified who's liable in those situations, then there might be some limitations on the technology. So I think we're we're thinking about the cart before the horse. I'm just talking about from like a what should be perspective and not like what happens if perspective. Well, no, if that makes sense. I think this is the way that a lot of good policy is or the, these rights are, because rather than talking in the abstract, I think throwing real life, or oh, supposedly real life cases at in, in <laughs> technology that, that we don't understand yet. Um, and actually somebody else do, is doing the same, some, some of this on the on social media. Um, so Sean, uh, Sean Sabatini on my LinkedIn um, raises a couple of interesting points that I think we should uh, reflect on. Um, so you've got a non-neurotypical person how can you obtain consent of a non-verbal person about getting their thoughts accessed, scrapped, whatever? Inter- so that's going to have to be something that would be brought into this uh, rights bill. What, uh, how do we get that to happen? There's got to be it, other ways of doing it. Can non-verbal people not write their signature on a piece of paper? Possibly. Yeah. That outlines? Yeah. Um, okay. But I think these, but again, I think it's, it's again, acknowledging, you know, the different type of people that we have and, you know, how do... There's... Yeah, there's more than one way to gather consent, and I'm um, the the uh, an interesting one here. So we really we talk if I, in terms of reading brain patterns, uh, reading your thoughts, and it, really talking about um, the activity within synaptic pathways. What about people who have non-typical synaptic pathways? You know, the whole that they, they have. Um, more of them, like sort of people who are more multilingual, people who are musical, things like that, and, and there's elements around that. But it's, so I honestly don't don't know the answer to that, and that is probably an entire new episode in itself. Um, presumably, once the technology gets a bit better, um, yeah, I think that that's interesting. But I think the the bit that he goes on to say is, if we can understand and read all of that, um, we promise we won't get into the technology. But I think this is cool. Um, how far from it would we be then into influencing people? So not necessarily um, giving them specific thoughts, 
via technology, but influencing what they're doing. It kind of goes back to what you said around, um, you know, people being able to put the right sort of advert in front of you. If we understand what their thoughts are, could we activate specific pathways in order to influence what they're thinking, in order to do, get them to do things like buy things or do uh, do certain actions? So, yeah, interesting. And then there's a whole cybersecurity element that he highlights that I think is a very good point. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's 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 save that one for another time as well. Um, good, good, good social thought. Mm. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that comes back to that autonomy being able to think uh on your own without influence or interference and then the um <laughs> the consent piece uh, that's an easy solve for me it, it the only scenario in which i can s- visualize is somebody who's blind deaf and cannot read braille and has no other way to communicate mm-hmm. in that case like there might be some issues with consent, but I think in most cases, you know, a, a piece of paper that says we are collecting this data, similar to what you sign when you go to the doctor for blood, you know, uh, we're conducting these tests. And with that, we'll be accessing, you know, your memories for the last six weeks. We'll be accessing, uh, you know, I don't know how this data will be like, <laughs> yeah, we'll do what the phrasing of this data, like, your your mem like what is a memory versus like your your um your vitals for the last you know is, is that stored somewhere in your brain can you access that I don't know like what can we what do we have access to and how do we categorize that whole other question I think outside of this it's sort of isn't it isn't because you're right we have we've we've majored here largely on uh, conscious thought um what about subconscious thought what about the other data that exists within your uh, within your brain that isn't about your um, your conscious thought, thought, conscious or subconscious thought. Um, it is about you know it, it's got the other stuff that is going on, um, and and then you've got dreams as well. Well, because that that yeah, I, I I possibly don't want to go down that. Mm. Well, and and then and then you have different brain functions happening in different parts of your brain. And so you're like, what if, what if you gave access to everything except for your prefrontal cortex? No. You don't know what critical, critical thinking is happening. You're getting sort of the raw input, you know, like I'm just wondering where, you know, or, or specific brain functions, right? You might just, just uh, tap in only to my prefrontal cortex and tell me how I'm thinking about, yeah, you know, how, get the get the input and then uh, give it input, recreate my prefrontal cortex and have it create an input based on, you know, uh, or have it create an output based on an input, like. So then it would, given a set of context, it would, it mapping how you think, not what you think, and so therefore it could give you right. Um, I've done a project on that. Just saying. Yeah, mm, it's quite cool. Yeah, cool stuff. Uh, not cool stuff. not as blatant as 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 the reading of the brain thing but certainly the the other side of it um and it's kind of it's it it bought well in fact it, it sparked a lot of conversations which we have done previously around but it is again worth, worth bringing up around um um what happens when you die all these things are stored they get reused because i think you and heidi did the um the actual episode yeah. Um, on this sort of thing, because I think I was on a holiday and I, I was commenting in the background. Um, but again, this is something that that I think um, we certainly I've spoken to um, David Burden about, who's a bit of an expert in in this type of thing as well. So this then comes comes up to that again around your not only your right to pri- privacy, but your your right to be deleted, but your right to die. Um, and therefore, if do you need to be able to put into your will, for example? To say, in the same way now that you know, you do you give somebody else access to your Facebook account? Um, is it still called Facebook this week? I think it is. I don't think that's trended off anywhere. Um, um, you give you know somebody kind of access to your Facebook account. That's fine, uh, but do you want them to have other people to have access to your thoughts after, that have been beautifully stored in the cloud, not been abused in any way, um, but they're there and therefore people can find out truly what you thought about them. 
after after you've died and there's no consequence for you? Um, or do you have the right to turn around and say, on my death, press that big red delete button? There's something else that should, yeah. should go into this neurotypical uh, neuro bill of rights. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah, I think the the right to opt out is is sort of one that rings true with those statements, right? Any system, technology, uh, platform that collects your data, you should be able to say no, thank you. Um, there's, yeah, I th- I think yes, I have some closing thoughts uh, that I want to get to, but I want to hear from you what are your closing thoughts on this because i can't believe we've already talked for almost 40 minutes on this wow that went quick um i think my last thought is is around again it's around government usage and it's at the moment a lot of so we've transitioned a lot in the past i would say 10 to 12 10 to 15 years to everything that you access for government is now online um that online is standard so if you want to order you know get work out when your bins are being collected all the way through to accessing uh, critical services online is the is the way you do it and anything else is by exception rather than so if you've got if you can't access the internet there is a paper version that you can find somewhere very in a very hard to do way how long are we when brain hcis become or bcis become the norm how far away are we from the government saying the way that you access this, this service is through a BCI? Um, no, no other way we'll do it because it's the easiest way for us to implement it and to know that you know, you're a legitimate person doing their thing. They'll make the case for it. Um, it might be 100 years away from now, but access by BCI is the only thing. Are we seeing the thin, thin end of a wedge at the moment? Well, we better make some good Bill of Rights for that because... That's, <laughs> that's what it's going to be built on. And I think along the, my final thoughts here on along the same lines of the Bill of Rights, there's some that we didn't even bring up. Uh, we touched on security a little bit, but the right to have those stored in a secure facility. I think the right to transparency, knowing what your data is being used for and how it's being used and what things they're doing to it and for what purposes. I think that's really important as well. I think we didn't even talk about sort of the non-discrim... We talked a little bit about non-discrimination, about thoughts, but there should be no sort of... The the presence or absence of certain thoughts should not be... You shouldn't be discriminated against because of those. Uh, and I think that touches on a lot of things, you know, and I think um, in kind of... I don't know. You, you can compare that to sort of equality other other equality laws out there, non-discrimination laws, those types of things to make sure everyone's treated fairly. I think there's also, um, you know, just to kind of end this out, I, I brought up the opt-out thing, but then there's also the right to remediation. If any of these rights are kind of broken, then you should have the right to seek, um, you know, some sort of remediation for those. I think this is a really interesting topic and I can't believe we talked about it for um, what seems like not that long at all, and it's already been 40 minutes. So uh, with that, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back to see what's going on with the Human Factors community right after this. Are you tired of boring lectures and textbooks on Human Factors and UX? Well, grab your headphones and get ready for a wild ride with the Human Factors Minute podcast. Each minute is like a mini crash course packed with valuable insights and information on various organizations, conferences, usability methods, theories, models, certifications, tools, and much more. We'll take you on a journey through the fascinating world of human factors, from the ancient history to the latest trends and developments. Listen in as we explore the field and discover new ways to enhance the user experience. From the think aloud protocol to the critical incident technique, focus groups, iterative design, we'll make sure that you're the smartest person in the room. Tune in on the 10th, the 20th, and the last day of every month for a new and interesting tidbit related to human factors. Don't miss out on the Human Factors Minute podcast, your ultimate source for all things human factors. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in human factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. 
our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our monthly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and access to the full library of Human Factors Minute, a weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting Human Factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember, it depends. Thank you to our patrons and all of you for selecting our topic this week. I forgot to mention before the break. And uh, thanks to our friends over at Scientific Scientific American for our news story this week. Uh, we do post all the links to all the original articles in our weekly roundups in our blog. You can also join us on our Discord for more discussion on these stories and much more. We also want to give a huge thank you, as always, to our patrons. We especially want to thank our Human Factors cast, All Access, and VIP patrons, Michelle Tripney. Patrons like you truly keep the show running. And uh, you know what? As I'm on the topic of our website and our blog posts, uh, I will go ahead and just plug the website, humanfactorscast.media. We post more than just our news roundups on there uh, that you can find every episode we've ever done, every interview that we've ever done. Uh, it's all indexed there for your convenience. So if you go in and search something like BCIs, you'll find every episode that we've ever done on BCIs. It's a great resource if you want to look into a certain topic area like AI, BCIs, cars, transportation. Uh, I don't know. Name something else, Barry. What else have we talked about on the show? Human factors comes up occasionally. Yes, do that. Go go do a search on Human Factors on the Human Factors Cast website, humanfactorscast.media. All right, let's switch gears and get to the next part of the show, simply called... Came from. It came from... It came from... Yes, this is the part of the show where we search all over the internet to bring you topics, the community... The, the ominous community, as it's referred to, uh, is talking about. If you find any of these answers useful, give us a like wherever you're watching or listening to help other people find this content. All right. This first one here is by user LTempierre10 on the Human Factors subreddit. They write, Human Factors Traveling Jobs. Are there traveling jobs for Human Factors professionals, especially in aerospace and aviation? I want to avoid desk roles and would appreciate any insights or recommendations. Barry, do you know of any jobs, roles that travel for work? Yeah, mine. I send do a fair bit of travel. It's one of these things that what is it you're trying to get out of it? It really depends. Are you talking about where you do cool things like go and sit in the cockpits and do analysis of, um, you know, pilot workload, things like that? That's one thing, and I've done a fair bit of that. I'll give you a hint after a while. It gets a bit samey. Um, or are you wanting to go to far-flung places and just talk to a broad range of different people? Then I think, actually, we, you know, you've got... Um, I know a lot of people who do like the conference circuit or you know down the academic side of things, where people go to conferences and do a lot of foreign travel. Uh, certainly, um, a good, good colleague of mine at the moment has spent a lot of time around everywhere from Australia, um, New Zealand, Japan, um, just in the past few weeks. And they get around quite a lot. If you're going to do, you know, if you want to have that sort of variation, rather than going to a large company that you might want to go more think about freelance and uh, become a consultant, that will get you out and about. But I guess it's more about the looking at the sort of things where you're looking at engaging with people, come up with reasons about why you have to travel rather than just being sat at a desk. And that is, a, you know, that's doing the, the, the sort of activities like workshop facilitation, like doing interviews, at, um, focus groups, that type of thing, where you might want to do more of that. But I think no matter what, you still end up sitting at a desk for, for a good chunk of time because no matter where you go, what you do, you've still got to write stuff up, you've still got to do the analysis, you've still got to do that type of thing. Um, and I, uh, at the risk of sounding slightly cynical, um once you've done so much travel, it gets boring really quickly. I think um, you certainly now with, with what I've learned, I think since COVID um, you can get so much more done over these type, you know, using your team zoom, whatever, whatever type of facilities, but getting that balance right between remote and face to face is absolutely key because you can't do it all remotely. 
That was a really long way around saying it depends, doesn't it? What do you think? Yep. Nick? It depends times two. Uh, so there's, so I have, I have two things and a secret. So the first thing is it depends on who you're talking to and their location and whether or not it's specialized. And then the second thing, or, or well, I guess that is the second thing, where they're, where they're at, they're right. who it is and where they're at. Um, if you are, if you have a user base that's everywhere, then unlikely that you'll need to travel. Um, there's always going to be desk work. So I agree with you there. There's always going to be desk work. You're always going to be do so, something. Um, it's not, I, I mean, unless you're like just in a data gathering role, but you need to process that information and you need to do something with it. So I can't imagine there's a scenario where someone would be doing all the fun stuff and then somebody else would be doing all the analysis on that fun stuff. I just don't see that. So, so there's, there's the who and there's the where. And there's scenarios where you have very specific users that are located in very specific types of places. So if you need to do like contextual inquiry, if you're doing um, like figuring out what they're doing and what they have on their desk and what's nearby as they reference this thing that you're building, or as you said, Barry, doing like a cockpit evaluation or something like that, a workstation, a workshop, uh, workspace evaluation, that type of thing. I think there's, um, there's a need to go out and do that stuff. Here's the secret. If you want to go to fairly exotic locations and um, travel the world, get into naval defense <laughs> contracting. Fair. Okay. Naval bases are usually uh, somewhere in uh, located by a body of water. And usually there's a lot to do by those bodies of water. And usually they're in fairly populous locations. Not always, but usually, um, you know, there's, there's got to be a community to support that base. And so if you need to go out to very specific users at these very specific bases that do these very specific things, you're going to need to travel. So there you go. <laughs> I would qualify that for those that know that I, last time I did that, I went to Baron Furnace for four years. Um, if you know, you know. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> All right. Let's get into this next one here. This next one by uh, I Desire Pickles on the U UX Research subreddit. I love the names of these things. They're brilliant. Oh, anyway, crafting, they write crafting research questions. They write, as a researcher in a new role, the design manager expects me to create research questions and validate assumptions about creating an app. I am struggling with this and seeking advice on how to approach it. Barry. Can I just use it depends again? Um, so actually, I, I like this question. It's a decent question because it's so different from uh, what does my portfolio look like? Right. And, um, so fundamentally, I think it, it almost goes to the crux of how, I mean, you're basically setting your own requirement at this point. And getting the requirement right at the beginning of the project, at the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the research element, is absolutely key to getting good research out the back end. Because if you understand what, it, what the question is you're trying to ask, then you'll understand whether you've answered it. And, and it sounds a simple thing to say, but actually the, 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 the face question, the, the obvious question, might not be the question that you truly get to the bottom of. So if you're trying to get to an app um, about and, and whatever you're doing, fundamentally, what does success look like? Is it the number of downloads? Is it the number of, of, of good you, um, customer feedback? Is it number of sales? Or, you know, what is the actual driving? The app doesn't exist just to exist. The app exists to do something. So therefore, how do you know if it's been successful? And there will be um, a an overarching thing that what success looks like. And therefore, that is really the question that you're trying to drive to. But that will be a very high-level question. I then tend to break it down to, four between four five six sub themes because things normally fit into that type of thing or maybe just the way i think about them um and you will be driven um because people love this people will want to have some sort of numeric output um because i think that is useful for them that's not necessarily useful for you so this is where you actually not only define the question but be quite 
stringent on why you're trying to get the the type of answer that you're trying to get. So it might be a scalar. It might be so. It might be something binary. It might be yes, no, I like it or dislike it. It might be a numeric. It might be something emotive. It might be something subjective, um, qualitative rather than quantitative. Um, as long as you know why you're getting the type of answer and what you're going to do um, with the data you get in order to answer your research questions, then that's entirely within your uh, remit. But everything has got to roll up to answering your research question, which is fundamentally um, achieving your requirement. Nick, what about you? I think that's right. Look at the goals of what you're trying to accomplish and start to think backwards into what questions will answer those goals. Ultimately, you're looking at like hypothesis validation or invalidation at the base assumption, right? You might have multiple hypotheses. You're trying to figure out whether or not your assumption of how people will do a certain thing or feel about a certain thing is true or untrue. And how can, what questions will get at that truth? Um, and, and so that's kind of the process that you work backwards from that. I think just in general, like, I, I think this is not like a researcher asking this. I feel like they've kind of been pushed into this role or they're asking the, somebody's asking them to do this and they're asking researchers who know how to do this, uh, for advice. And so some practical things to look for here, um, question banks are a great place to start. I know like maze has a good one. Uh, there's, there's tons of question banks and question batteries out there pick and choose from those which might you know and modify them for validating or invalidating those hypotheses that you have that those might be a good place to start alternatively if you don't know of any question banks or you're just not hitting the right ones um i don't always advocate for this but use something like uh an, an ai language model you can say something along the lines of here are the goals that i'm trying to do for this study and it'll, you know, what 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 are some questions that I can ask you re uh, users to figure out these things? It'll come up with some things. They're not all going to be great, but it might give you a starting point for thinking about what other questions you can ask, um, or what sort of categorization things that you can uh, start to put together to measure those things. Um, and if you need to, you can always ask it to follow up and say, "How does this get to the goal?" And that might actually give you some good thoughts into how to approach that. Okay, let's get into this last question here. All right. Uh, researchers, how long do you keep your recordings? This is by Kim Yu on the user experience some Reddit. They write, when do researchers usually delete their usability test recordings? Or in this case, we'll just say any data collection. Um, I have recordings from two studies and my laptop is running out of space. Should I get an external drive? Barry, what do you think? So I think the test recordings here is is relatively important because the it is something that you will be um, thinking actually I'll hold on to that because that's your core that's your raw material isn't it that's the that's the, that's the actual words of the people that you've got. However, I'm going to suggest that really be careful with with just how long you keep this stuff for because firstly legalities there are legal things around here um, so in Europe particularly G GDPR. Um, and general data protection rights um, and general data protection in of itself. You should only keep data um, and people for as long as you need to use that data for. Um, you shouldn't just be keeping data just for um, for the sake of it. Um, so when you do your initial recording, you should be upfront with your um, subjects about saying, I'm using the data for it to do this and I will be keeping the data for this long and at the end of it, I will be doing this with it and exp you should already know what your data plan is and um, that should be part of your briefing um and really i would say for recordings in particular as short as possible don't hang on to them uh, once you've transcribed them once you've done your notes but make sure you've done your transcription and you've done your notes and, ana and analysis before you delete them um because you 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 you'll transcribe them and then you'll think, actually, I need to go back and look at, particularly if you're looking at something as well, it's not just about what they've said, it's about what they're doing, it's about their, their body, all that sort of stuff. But it should be as short as possible because people do have a right to be be forgotten. Um, people do have a right to ask for a um, data access request in, in the UK, freedom of information request, whatever you want to call it, depending on where you're at. So if you're holding more of this data, then actually the, um, the more of a headache you're creating for yourself. Um, 
So I would say once you've transcribed, noted, and analyzed, done basically once you've done what you need to do with with the actual recordings, I would delete them, get get rid of them as soon as possible, because a from a um, a logistical perspective, as as the um, the, the original as original poster is highlighted, you know it takes up space, and you have to think about where I'm going to store it. You have to, it has to be stored correctly. You know you have to store it securely. You can't just have it on random thumb drives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if nothing else, if you've got nothing else in place, once a project is finished, a general rule of thumb I always go to is you keep the data that you've got. So I would I, I would close a project down and I keep all data uh, for five years um, because the you know if you, you might end up there might be legal issues coming up, there might be anything where you have to prove ev- evidence, um, particularly if you've been involved in design, design sign offs, um, anything like that. Um, a general rule of thumb, keep things for five years. On one things, so do a general, uh, on project shutdown, do a cleanse. Keep the basics, uh, the the the, raw, uh, the basic information that you need for five years um, and you will determine that what on the type of project and the type of evidence you might be, need to produce. And then at the end of five years, get rid of everything but the essentials. That was a long way around saying, and that, that was an entire um, data management program. Nick, what do you think? Uh as to not incriminate me. Uh, <laughs> I think, look, here's here's the thing is you, it depends. Um, the first and foremost, have a data plan. Specify in your informed consent how long you keep that data. There is, I, I guess there's one sort of uh, edge case where it's okay to keep data indefinitely. One, if it's your data, um, you can keep that. If you've accessed it from some other usability researcher, you can keep that, right? I think there's uh, you you should be entitled to your data, and we talked about data all this episode, so I'm just going to leave it at this. If if the people that you are talking to are internal and you're storing that internal, then I don't think there necessarily needs to be a limitation on it, although. Uh, I'm talking from like a U.S. perspective where companies come first and, <laughs> you know, we don't quite yet have the GDPR over here. So uh, I'm a hoarder. So I personally am really bad about this. I don't. It, But it is such a it, it's a, it actually I think this will make a fascinating, fascinating episode in its own right, because the we have such a drive to you don't want to throw stuff away because what happens if you get some a nice little niche bit of data out of that that you didn't get on the first pass or you know if something does come back and you want to refer to it why wouldn't you but equally i've been through so many projects now where you never touch it again um you just yeah. don't and you, you have the best of intentions all that sort of stuff but as soon as that de- as soon as that project's over you're out of there and you're on to the next project ah but see here's the um, thing is like for for me what what i want to do is like go through and do a massive search across all the transcripts and do search for anytime somebody has mentioned this phrase and be like, Oh, this thing that we're looking at now, let's go back and check that out. So uh, define it. Um, I think that, but I think that's a really good point though. I think your, um, your having your transcripts um, or your, your end analysis, I wouldn't throw that away um, because it would be suitably anonymized and all that sort of stuff. Um, the raw recordings I would, I would definitely throw. Anyway. Okay. All right. Good question. All right. Uh, time for one more thing. Barry, what's your one more thing? I can't remember. I need to scroll down now because I've got so excited by having three, um, um, three came from that we actually, actually had to think about. Um, so I guess for me this week, I got a, a level of honesty, um, or a level of reflection. Um, we've been, talking a lot um and i wrote about wrote an article on this recently in for the ergonomist that is just hitting the um hit, hitting the things now um hit the doorsteps around the value of leadership and i like to think i'm not a bad leader um i can do all this sort of stuff but i was caught um caught up short the other day when we were looking we we were doing some work and I do get into a habit, and I can be really guilty of it, of not delegating out work because I think, A, it's quicker to do it myself. B, I know it will be done to the standard that I want to be do- doing it if I do it myself to the point that um, you know 24 hours in a day just isn't enough for doing it. Um, and but long-time listeners to this show will know that um, both me and my wife work together um, in, in my company. And she did turn around the other day and say, oh, you're, you're an amazing leader. You can motivate people. And all. 
but you're a rubbish manager. You can't delegate. You talked about talked about other people about delegating, but when it comes to it, you just can't let go, and you need to work on that. Um, now, having been running my own company now for you know, over eleven years, it's nice of her to leave it to now to tell me this. Um, but I just thought it was really interesting because she she is absolutely right. I am I'm quite. It takes me a long time to be able to just be able to delegate stuff off, um, and then still keep the right level of uh, of support in place. So I just thought it was really interesting because I'm, you know, um, we talked about burnout last week uh, in the last episode. This episode, I, my one more thing was just I need more than 24 hours in a day. I just haven't got enough hours in the day to do all the things I want to do. And actually part of that is because I need to reflect more on my ability to delegate work off and let people get on with it. I feel better for saying that. Good. What's your What's your one more thing? Well, if you need more than 24 hours in a day, I need more than five minutes for a one more thing. So I'm going to try to keep this short. If you want to hear the full story, go listen to the pre-show. Uh, but I managed to sprain both of my knees at the same time. And it's a hilarious story. Uh, I was squatting um, and I came out of a squat and heard both my knees pop and woke up on the floor face up uh, with my wife over me saying, what happened? I said, I don't know. My legs still hurt. So that's one thing. The other thing that I want to say is just a huge shout out to one of our listeners, Noah, who sent a lovely voicemail um, after I had gone on last week about burnout. uh, And he was giving me some advice and kind of how he's sharing some similar thoughts. I'm not going to play it on the episode. I don't think that's that's right. It was a very um, it was a very nice thing to receive. So thank you, Noah, for that. And uh, just an update on the burnout thing. I'm freaking back, baby. We're back. Oh, no. I don't think I can take it. All right. And, that, and with that, <laughs> go, okay, what, what, go, go ahead and say, Barry. No, I think that that's very good to hear. And I'm pleased. Firstly, thank you to Noah for reaching out. It makes this feel like it, it you know, it makes it feel like the community it is, that um, people can realize that they, that everybody needs a, um, a pat on the back occasionally. That we're human too. We're not just personalities that come on and talk about human factors every week. <laughs> that's true. Yes. <laughs> anyway, that is it for today, everyone. If you like this episode and enjoy some of the discussion about BCIs and the tech they use, uh, and maybe even about mental privacy, I'll encourage you all to go listen to episode 279, BCIs Pose a Threat to Mental Pi- Privacy. Piracy, too. Uh, comment wherever you're listening what you think of the story this week. For more in-depth discussion, you can always join us on our Discord community. Uh, visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show, there's a couple things you can do. One, you can stop what you're doing. Leave us a five-star review right now. That's free for you to do, and we really appreciate those. Tell your friends about us. That is also free for you to do, and costs you nothing and if you want to send money our way we have a patreon with a bunch of different benefits that you can look at on our website uh so please go do that if you have the financial means to and want to support us that way Uh, as always links to all of our socials and our website are in the description of this episode mr barry kirby thank you for being on the show today where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about uh your invasive thoughts well you can just plug into my head at um twitter or x depending on where uh, how rebellious you're, rebellious you're feeling. I'm Baz underscore K on there and across other socials. Or if you want to listen to some interviews with esteemed people around the Human Practice community, find me on 1202 The Human Practice Podcast at 1202podcast.com. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Remember, next no, no show next week. Until next time, it, it depends. depends. And scene and the audio will come shortly. I click the button. Oh, I'm boiling, melting. That was fun. That was good. It's always those shows. It is. It's the it's the topics that you think that are not necessarily going to be because we. I mean, we had no notes to well, a small handful of notes for that compared to normally we'll have like a really good sort of breakdown of points and all that sort of stuff. We had one, two, three. We had four notes there. That were you know, out. you know what, Barry? I've, I've. Do I say this? I don't know. Yeah, do it. Go on. I don't know if I should say this. I'm just gonna hide behind the microphone. Okay. But now we won't go to hear what you say.
No, it's okay. I'll just shout from back here. <laughs> so cool. Ow. Ah, my knees. Oh, oh geez. Geez. <laughs> Okay, I'll say it since I've hinted at it. Um, I've... Oh, God, this is going to sound so bad when I say it, Barry. I'll just say it anyway. I don't Let's... want you or anybody else to judge me for doing this. I'm going to judge you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've realized that when I put some good notes on the show notes, Barry sometimes steals them. <laughs> eh, fair comment. <laughs> no, to, that's also why I try and get I write. So my it came from. I tend to write my it came from before you write yours. Right. Because you can, you you then steal mine. I never steal your it came from. <sighs> when did I steal your it came from? You're going to make me go back and now find it. But I, I, there's definitely been at least two times that I know that you stole points out of my came from. Twice? Twice. Well, it has been over a year since I've been doing this, so that, that's legitimate. Um, but yeah, fair comment. Oh, 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 it came from. I thought I thought you were talking about one more thing. Yeah, it came from. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um, oh. And then, see, but see I, I see our discussion points as just a free-for-all. I do too. And and to be clear, like I don't go and write a whole bunch of notes that are uh like like I wrote up just like I, I don't know if you could tell. I had my own document for the AI Bill of Rights. Um or not AI Bill of Rights, the uh that was one of my references for the um the mental bill of rights or the BCI Bill of Rights, whatever you want to call it. I I was adapting some points for that. And I had like them in a separate document just as a way to freely talk about those and throw those out there as augmentations to our discussion. And yeah, you're right. Like it wasn't that I thought you would steal any of those. It just happened a little bit more naturally when I had my notes and you had your notes and it was a conversation, yeah, which yeah. I think is is yeah. actually flowed really nice. Yeah. And I've been doing this for a couple shows now. And I think some of the shows that we've had recently are, are knocking it out of the park. So I think I'm going to keep doing this. Works. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't pay any attention to my notes at all. I just say what, what comes into my head. So. It's, um, hey, me too. Mostly. It's, uh... um, so I have to show you this. A few weeks ago, I, tell, I told you that I had started like strapping everything together on my Steam Deck. Yes. Okay. I actually did the prep and I, I brought it in. So here's here's the Steam Deck, right? There's the like the base Steam Deck. Okay. No. All right. So now on the back, I have this dock that's actually, you know, piggybacking off of it. And it's fine. It doesn't add too much bulk to it, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, uh, now below that, I have this magnet. Now, this magnet, you can kind of see there, is just bolted on. It's not bolted on. It's just stuck on with some 3M tape, right? And it stays there just fine. And I have, you know, all my cables kind of just hanging out here. It's a little annoying when I. Okay, but here's here's where it gets a little ridiculous. All right. You want to see where this gets ridiculous? Okay, so I mentioned I have a power bank. Okay, here's my power bank. And on both sides, I have one of these. um, One of these uh, little. Like. um, Oh, the magnetic strip. Okay. Now, this power bank's nice because if you click the button, you can actually see how much is left on it. Right now, it says uh, 67%, right? So you can see that mm-hmm. up there in the corner. Okay. Yeah. So, magnet, meet, power bank. Whoa. <laughs> so now, I can I can keep gaming, and if I want to, you know, like, see what the... And it actually sticks on there pretty well. If I wanted to see what the power is, I can kind of hold it like this... And, you know, it's a little bit more balanced. So I, I just wanted to show that because I, I don't think many people could envision what I was talking about last time when I was like, yeah, I put a power bank on the back of my Steam Deck. And it's actually really heavy. Like, it doubles the weight. Say, does it not make it top heavy as well? Does it not make it like we'll sort of want to rotate out your hand? Um, Not really. So if I keep it low enough, it actually, the weight is like centered just enough to where it's resting on my middle fingers which is just below, like you can tell, it's kind of like sitting on my middle fingers, which is, and it yeah, almost yeah, wants yeah. to roll down uh, still. But yeah, it actually ends up being pretty comfortable weight-wise for like gaming. Um, I usually rest it on my lap or whatever. 
so that way it's not like a full thing but anyway yeah it's oh. it's funny because then also let's say and i still haven't figured out a way to do this like efficiently but my phone has something you know very similar in the back as those plates so that way i can just do it wirelessly in my car and so <laughs> I actually just shove my phone on the back of it if i wanted to cool um, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but what i want to do is get like a uh I don't know. I've, I've been thinking about this, but like get essentially like a little bracket like that. Okay. You see this, this little bracket here, shove it there and then have my phone magnetized on the bracket. So that way I can like put up guides and you know, whatever, and just have it hanging out right here above my steam deck and follow like walkthroughs or whatever I need to. Or I could be watching YouTube videos or something as That's I'm a, playing. Ultimate, ultimate multitasking tool. Yeah, it really is. I'm, I mean, this is like, it's a little ridiculous, the like <laughs> whole magnet thing. But I think it's actually kind of cool, too, because it it makes it expandable in ways that I didn't think about before. Like, I don't know. If I really wanted to, I could throw, I don't know, here, here's what we'll do, um, whoops, ow, ouch, that hurt, mm, my phone just hit my toes, ow, at least you didn't hit your knee, because that would have been more painful, all right, here's, here's what we could do, you ready for this one? I could put, I have, it's all metals. So <laughs> I have uh, uh, this old uh, thing that sits below your desk for a keyboard slider. Just put that right back there. I don't know. And now, oh, 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 oh. Do you see what I see? Because I can now screw in my phone. And smash the screen. And smash the screen, Jeff. Yay! Yep, there, there it is. There it is. There it is. I got it. You ready? Here it is. Check that out. Okay, the phone's sitting back there. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just still, I, I still think the thing of having your the phone and the screen on at the same time, um, that's a mind blast in itself because the whole multitasking piece. That's I ultimately want to get it set up, and I think the best, like uh, the best way forward for that is to just get a flat plate for the back of it and put a magnet on the top of that flat plate, so I can literally flat plate it, and then my phone sits right above it, and then that way I can watch Human Factors Cast as I'm uh, gaming. Cool. Or podcasts in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So do you find you're using that um, that gaming device a lot then? Are you still enjoying it? Because you were raving about it a few weeks ago. Every so, day. Still at wow. Every day. It's nice. Good stuff. So well 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 worth well recommended then, is what you're saying. I think so. There's cheaper models that you can get than this one. So mine has like mine's the, you know, the um what is it? 512 gigabytes or whatever. And I have a thousand in my, um, my little expandable SD card there. You can get like 64 gigabytes and expand the internal memory up to like two gigs or something. Um, but it doesn't have like the anti reflect screen, which still reflects, but probably not as much as like a, the other the shiny one. would. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I love it. It's uh it's nice. And like, What's really nice too is I have I have this portable dock like literally backpacked onto it. So if I go traveling, I just throw a USB uh power into it and then plug that into the uh HDMI on the TV and I got, you know, I can play it wherever I'm at with a PlayStation 4 controller. Oh, cool. Okay. And yeah. and it works great. Uh um, So in many ways that that's working a bit like a Switch then. It does work very much like a Switch with respect to that like and i also have you know a dock here that i just 
literally plug the USB-C into the thing here and it works like the same way. Um, and it works with my setup here. So if I unplug my personal computer, I can plug this in and game, you know, on my monitors here, which is nice too. So, um, but I have, I have a, another PC up here, so I wouldn't want to do that. But awesome. yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. It's great. That's cool. So if we're not doing a show for doing a show next week, what are you going to do with your with with your extra time? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I sleep. Oh, it's daytime for you, isn't it? So I guess I guess not. Yeah. No, I have. Um, I actually have user meets next Thursday, so I. I will be analyzing data at this time next week. Fucking wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think what I'll be doing. Um, I don't know. I go to the pub. Go to the Ooh. pub in the Wait, is it, in fact, no, if, if I've done that, then I'll be just getting kicked out of the pub at this point. Um, you know, Barry, I, that just... Uh... That just unlocked something. Uh oh. No, no, no. It's a good thing. And I like. <laughs> hang on. I wonder. I'm gonna type this in chat, and and I wonder okay. you read this. Hold on. <laughs> what if we? Yeah, possible. Yeah. With beers. Yeah. Or it could be an opportunity to do other things too. Like um like or um I don't know. I it just just thinking about like a couple things. It's weird because I'm like referencing all this stuff <laughs> in text. I just don't want to expose it, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's a. Um, it, it, the idea is that if, if we look at how it makes better use of the time. Exactly, exactly. Because it's it's not so much the time commitment; it's the everything else. Yeah, the headspace yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and stuff. So I've got another interesting problem that um, I'm going to help with. So. In our new offices, I've mentioned we've got some new offices. I think I have once or twice. Um, we've just Did got you get a new car too. No, that that it's it's a year old now. Yes, I've I had can't that believe car. that. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, so I, I know that because we just had to renew the insurance on it, and I nearly cried. Um, the so we've got a new sign. It's a quite it's a small sign. It's about I guess a fourteen by twelve inch sign, something like so. So relatively small. Um, to go outside above the door of the office. And I assumed, um, so we got the sign of off my, my usual supplier. Brilliant service. And, he, you know, I asked him for it the other, like, three days ago or something, and it arrived today. The guy is amazing at turning stuff around quickly. Um, but when he came, I assumed it would have mounting holes, and it doesn't. So I was thinking... Hey, I mean, it's no effort to drill some holes in. That's that's easy. Oh boy, what have you done? What me? Yeah. Oh, I'm just flipping my mic over to make it tighter. Um, yeah. So, drilling holes in in the sign relatively easy. You, you can crack on and do it. But actually, could I trust modern technologies and actually glue it up outside instead? So it's a metal sign, probably aluminium. Okay. Sign, going aluminium. on to a wooden plinth, I guess, type of thing. Um, like I say, it's, it's relatively lightweight, so it's not... Thing. So it's it's the sort of thing that probably, like, River Little or something like that, you know, some sort of epoxy-type um, affair, um, would probably work on. But I've never done it before. So I think it, it might either... It might prove an interesting experiment, because it should do, because so things like um, Gorilla Glue, other, other brands are available, Um that's what they said, you know, that's what it prides itself on, uh, being able to bond um, like metal with wood and, and things like that um, in a waterproof 
way. So if anybody on social uh, on the socials or who's listening to this um, has got any thoughts or ideas, then um, then chuck them into chat or in, 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 into the comments um, and let me know because I think it would be um, hugely useful. Ideally, it's something I'd like to do tomorrow. But I've got another sort of problem with that. In the, So the, the sign is outside. Mm-hmm. There's an old sign to come down and we are right opposite the pub. So there's a local pub and it is literally just the other side of the street where people frequent it pretty much from 8 o'clock in the morning all the way through to 11 o'clock at night. So I would have to be on a stepladder taking the old sign down, which is not going to be an easy task because part of the, you know, the screws are rusted and it's going to need a bunch of prep and stuff like that. The chances of me falling over or just people giving me sake comments as I'm doing said job uh, is probably quite high. Therefore, I need to think about how I'm going to um, how I'm going to achieve this um, without anybody mocking me being up a ladder and potentially falling off and all that sort of stuff. So this whole thing around a new sign is going to be quite... Um, Quite a challenge. I'm looking forward to it. Got what it. could possibly go wrong? Nothing. We shall I, believe, see. I believe you have this. Well, there'll be... I presume I'm probably going to put it on over the weekend, so um, there will be presumably photos at some point. I love that. I'm just thought, I don't have... If I glue this up, I could glue metal to metal and not actually take the previous sign down at all. And just glue the, this one in front of it. Is the one, the previous one, is that s- smaller or is it? It's the same size. It's pretty much exactly, oh. I think it'll be ever so slightly smaller. Um, oh. But um, I wonder whether I've got a picture of, of, of so I can. I think yeah, that could work. That could work. Um. I love how this is like our headspace to figure things out because I'm also like churning on something too in my head that we just talked about. And um, I'm like, oh, would that work? And you're like, oh, would that work? In other ways. And we're both just sitting over here going, ooh, would that work? Yeah, see, it's there, but I don't. Can you see that? Oh, yes, you can see that well enough. Um, right. I'm. Let's chuck a share up. Um, oh, I'm going to need to do stuff then. Okay. You are, we take away our name tags. That one. And in fact, I'll just uh, leave this little number up here. Okay, here we go. All right. So if you see that, you can see, see my mouse on the screen. See that little sign there. So the roller door here in the middle, that is the entrance to my, our new offices. Because we've got these two floors above, um, where you've got the Soxham shop and this shop here, we've got the two floors above it. Um, okay. So quite like. So, but you access it by this little roller door here, right? And then this little sign above here is just okay. what the previous people had. So what I've got is a sign that is exactly the same size as that. That should use the wooden plinth behind it, um, and so my sign will just go directly over that. Um, and I was I was assuming that I would I would need to take this one down in order to put mine on it. But actually, I don't necessarily need to have to do that. I could potentially um, just glue straight onto that and um, it'd be a thing. You could. Um, that might be an easier way of doing things. Um, I shall have to think about that. Because that, that, that means this sign will need preparation. I don't believe the company that was there, be- or the organization that was there before was actually, well, like, that sign's been up there for ages and nobody's claimed it back so um yeah we shall see anyway right i'll stop sharing okay. that. all right all right but yeah so that, that's that's the uh the challenge for the weekend the challenge uh, for the weekend well, I, I like that like uh, i just uh as as you were talking i just realized that i have i have things that i can put my phone into <laughs> brilliant and um, now, like, how do I get this ball joint through one of these holes? Granted, it won't be a magnetic clip like I wanted, but I could potentially just attach, you know, the ball joint there uh, 
to that and then all I would need to do is just slap it on there and it's done. I do have magnetic things elsewhere though. Magnets, man, they're cool. Yeah, I always do worry about them though, about whether you're going to cuz I know electronics is is now are now better developed in or and recognizing that magnets are now a um a useful thing to use. Um, but I still have the whole don't put them near screens, don't put don't put them near your phone, even though we use them near the phones and stuff like that. Oh yeah. I'm just old school. So th this, <laughs> this actually came from one of these. Right, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Now if I ever needed a little bit more of a of a of a holder for this thing, I could always just there I'm, I'm not going to suggest you might be over engineering things but um you know this is exactly what i was saying the other week is that i'm over engineering this stuff and also this is this is too heavy to support its weight look it'll fall yeah no and, and it'll give you a uh, next strength yep but, um don't need that right now oh but this thing does have a kickstand built in too look at that oh cool the the, the, the dock yeah all oh, right okay yep so Oh, very cool stuff. I'll take that off. Uh... Well, I have the joy tomorrow morning of because I had the at a full council meeting today uh, of the Syrian chef, which was which was fun, um, and we got through that in a, in a morning. Which normally takes us if we do a physical meetup, we tend to fill the day. But it's amazing how on on online we can actually get through um material quicker um but tomorrow i get to have the morning of going to what's called fees which is the european federation of european ergonomic societies um which is going to be interesting it's my first meeting with them and so it'll be interesting to see um to see what comes from that and I, I suggested that I might be, or I, I could be a little bit blunt when I'm there, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll we shall see. So I, I struggle to a certain extent with these high level societies, um, you know, fees, IEA, things like that. About are we try, are we replicating what we're doing, or are we are we uh, should they be there to be more strategic? And so that's something I'm exploring at the moment. Interesting, yeah. That's how we rock and roll, you know. I, I love rocking and rolling. Um, oh. I'm fired up, man. I'm excited. I'm pleased you are. I'm ready for bed. I'm so tired. I think it's so hot as well. Um, it was really funny. Too. We spoke, I went to pick my daughter up from the um, um, from the bus because um, she started, school, uh, started sixth form um, this week. Um, or college this week and um, so I picked her up from the bus and she jumped in the car and it's been really really hot and so car's nice and cool she get, gets out of the car she wears glasses the first thing that do happens is glasses oh, okay. yeah and she couldn't see a thing um, it, ma it made me laugh in a way that shouldn't have been that funny oh yeah I, I felt the same way uh, when my knees buckled yeah let me put it that way but that would that is funny to be fair. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's not. We 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 I'm sure everybody sympathizes with me. I'm sure. I'm gonna get a nice voicemail from Noah saying, I'm really sorry about your knees. Just keep them elevated. He was very nice. He was very nice in his um he actually left like a voice message. Cool. And um I I gotta go back and like Because I did something silly the other night as well in terms of I had a I was trying to cut a, an ingrown toenail on, on my foot and happened to a, a, a small lapse of concentration meant that I cut into the end of my big toe turns out there's a lot of blood in your big toe because like, of the type of um, thing that it is and it was probably pouring blood all over the bathroom floor and I was like this was meant to be a two minute job I now can't get upstairs to get into my bedroom um, because I, I can't find any plasters I can't go upstairs without leaving a trail of blood everywhere. And so I'm lying on the bathroom floor with like sort of tissue over it with putting um, uh, compression on it to stop the bleeding. 
and and I basically sat down there and my wife wondering where I've got to because obviously you're not coming to bed because I'm sat on the bed, uh, the bathroom floor um, bleeding waiting out. for my, bleeding out and my waiting for my toe to stop so yeah that, so we we all do amusing things like that this yeah. okay I just gotta say this message two minutes and twenty one seconds long that that's a considered message that's that's not a up your right message so uh, yeah well, that, well like, that's what I'm saying. Good man. Yeah. Thanks, Noah. And uh, thank you all for, for tuning in and watching us live. Really appreciate you all here. Indeed. Um, we'll be off next week. Be yeah. Back two weeks from now. Two weeks time. Hopefully. Talk about something. Be on the lookout for our poll that you can all vote in. Um, become a patron. You'll be alerted when those polls go out for just a dollar a month. Or more, if you want to do that. Um, all right. We'll take off, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you for joining us, and uh, take care of yourselves and your loved ones. See you Everybody, later. Bye. bye. Are you tired of boring lectures and textbooks on human factors and UX? Well, grab your headphones and get ready for a wild ride with the Human Factors Minute podcast. Each minute is like a mini crash course packed with valuable insights and information on various organizations, conferences, usability methods, theories, models, certifications, tools, and much more. We'll take you on a journey through the fascinating world of human factors, from the ancient history to the latest trends and developments. Listen in as we explore the field and discover new ways to enhance the user experience. From the think aloud protocol to the critical incident technique, focus groups, iterative design, we'll make sure that you're the smartest person in the room. Tune in on the 10th, the 20th, and the last day of every month for a new and interesting tidbit related to human factors. Don't miss out on the Human Factors Minute podcast, your ultimate source for all things human factors. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in human factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our monthly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and access to the full library of Human Factors Minute, a weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting human factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember... 